Oh yeah, well actually, you know, we have our panelists, so uh, I think we can get started. Maybe just quick introduction. So hey, I'm Griff Green. Uh, I'll I'll be moderating the panel. Uh, you know, I manage, I, I support Common Stack and Giveth and a whole bunch of other region a microeconomy startup uh, uh, incubators. That's kind of my my jam. And uh, but also I'll let the other panelists introduce themselves. So we have uh, well under Anna Lee under O Yule Almond. Uh, maybe you can introduce yourself as well. Hello everybody. Hello. Sorry we had technical difference difficulties. I had to jump on Almond's laptop. But I'm uh, I'm Anna Lee or Tracy, and I'm the founder of Herdow. Herdow is a woman focused developer DAO. Uh, yeah, that, that's it. Hello, everybody. Right. And I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to Wonka to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Juan Carlos, and I have been leading uh, Gravity in the TEC, that is a project that aims to foster um, conflict management in DAOs and conflict competence as a cultural thing in these kind of organizations. Nice. And then I'll toss it over to Garrett. It's, yeah. Awesome. Good morning, Griff. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Garrett Ackerman. I'm out here in uh, Los Angeles, California, and I, uh, I'm i the founder of Crypto Heart, which is uh, an organization that, that uh, is looking to um, help, help include more artists with disabilities in this space um, and in just advance inclusion for for the disability community and kind of this new digital world that we're living in. So um, really excited to be here and learn more about everybody's, uh, you know, fun, fun things going on. So can't wait. Wow. Thanks a lot, Gary, for coming in so early. Uh, this is part of ch the challenge of inclusion culture for sure. Time zones. Yeah. <laughs> it is, man. It's all good, though. I'm, I'm already at this early anyway, so. Oh, good. It's all good. Nice. Well, maybe we can start with you. What, uh, we're just going to have some warm-up rounds. What, what does inclusion culture mean to you, Garrett? I, that's a great, I, I would love to hear everybody else's opinion on this, too. But um, I think just understanding everybody's, uh, everybody's point of view and making sure everybody feels, feels welcomed, comfortable, and, and has a seat at the table um, and has a voice. Because uh, I don't think everybody's perspective is really... Um, uh, taken into consideration for a lot of things. So I think that's just the really important thing. I, I'm just looking through specifically the disability. I was like, um, I just don't think a lot of people understand their perspective. And then they also don't really usually have a seat at the table, which makes it even harder for people to understand their perspective. So um, that's, that's kind of a long winded answer, but that's kind of what I think. Uh, Anna Lee, do you do you have do you have uh, an idea for what does inclusion culture mean to you? Okay, like for me, when I when I look at inclusion, oh, hang on, can you hear me? No. Yeah, we hear you great. So can you, you can hear me, right? Noise. Yeah, the background noise isn't too bad. Oh my god, they're starting to do work everywhere. Sorry, I'm I keep moving from room to room, kind of trying to get some peace and quiet. Right, so um, yes, inclusion to me, uh, I always take the wider equitable view. So like, when people are talking about inclusion, they're not only talking about Oh, Lee, I think, I think, I think Lee, and then, on, on Lee, I think you moved a little far from the internet. I, I don't know if you could get back to the people, internet router to the room people, where you're closer to the router. Meet their, okay, l l let me move closer to the router. Sorry, no, right. no worries. Is that uh, better? It's much better. Oh, sorry. Okay, so. I just like to talk about people's like uh, a take a wider equitable view, and we have to meet people's basic needs. So there's no point in trying to onboard people to Web three when they don't even have connectivity. They're not connected to the internet. They might not have a computer. They might even have stable housing. That you, you know, this is like 
we kind of have to start from there you know so like when we're talking about mass adoption and inclusion you know we really have to keep these points in mind otherwise it just becomes you know like a little vanity exercise or like like a ticking boxes exercise and not a meaningful um impactful exercise at all you're muted brief wow but then you unmuted just as i was saying uh what do you what does inclusion culture mean to you yeah, I think that um, inclusion culture is also being sure that the system uh, w won't be um, manipulated by power balances. Like um, we are trying to build um, horizontal and non-hierarchical structures. And um, I think um, like something that promotes inclusion is knowing that w once you come into this organization, um, into these organizations, um, everyone can be in the same in the same level, and that uh, because there's people that has participated before, it doesn't uh, make them any different from the newcomers. Totally, and. and I mean, I guess one of the challenges with inclusion and, and a diversity of opinions is, is conflict. And that's, of course, your jam, Lanka. I mean, can inclusive culture be a source of con conflict? Yes, yes, because um, inclusion means um, including uh, our shadow and um, the voices that are not um, strongly heard and uh, the voices that are not um, the mainstream voices. So. Um, inclusion sometimes uh, it means also to be open to conflict because it means to be open to receive um, decent uh, and uh, different thoughts because uh, it would be much faster if we just um, apply one idea and we go with it but um, that wouldn't be inclusive and um, that's why uh, like having conflict it's something and opening a space for conflict is something that can help shape um, DAOs into a more inclusive culture. Yeah, nice. Now, well, and I want to toss it over to Annalie, like, just to give us, because really the focus of this talk is uh, inclusion culture in public goods. And I'm curious how far along you think that we are in the public goods space. Um. I think we're coming along. It's looking way better than it did like a few years ago. You know, um, I think with the with the uh, resurgence of DAOs and this kind of like collective collaborative way of working and, you know, the whole Web3 kind of Cambrian explosion, then it's kind of looking it's looking way it's kind of looking way better um we obviously have so much more to do we're really just at the beginning of this and um people are seeing web3 as 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 a way that we can finally reconstruct society and reconstruct um you know political institutions even um and the way of work and like you know finance and we can finally get to a place where you know things actually work for all of us you know so like you're you're kind of like here we're all going to make it and prosperity for all and all of this kind of stuff which sounds super super cool but uh but yeah we are really really still at the beginning i mean with like with like heard out where uh three months ago there were you know there there were half as many as like women's uh web3 groups as there are now in the last three months there's been a proliferation of kind of women's groups and people um really focusing on inclusion and diversity and that's like a that's like a great thing but we're we're nowhere near as uh we're nowhere near you know the the point the kind of tipping point where we can say we've like done enough Yeah, and uh, sometimes doing enough is like almost just taken as a token, a token effort, you know. Uh, and and uh, I want to toss it over to Garrick and, and ask like, how can we, how can we make it possible to foster inclusion without it just being a symbolic effort? Like maybe you can talk about the importance of 
of bringing in people with disabilities into the Web3 space and in real life? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, um, I think uh, at least from the disability community side, we've taken a big step with Web3, but it's, uh, I'm, I'm personally still learning how we, how we can do it. For example, like there's still things like, uh, um, you know, if in a DAO or in a, in a, even in a Discord, like um, if someone's, let's say, uh, like deaf or blind, like how do we, how do we, how do we, uh, you know, design, let's just call it a Discord for now, um, a Discord for, you know, folks that are deaf or blind um, or that have autism. Like how can you um, design something digitally to make it a, a more inclusive? Because it's essentially Discord is like a digital city, you know. Right here, we're sitting in the town hall. Like, if this was, if this was Los Angeles, you know, it would be designed in a way that would be inclusive for people, um, at least physically. Um, so, I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn more uh, about that. Um, but, hey, so we're in the early stages. But uh, if you don't mind asking the question one more time, I completely got off track. Yeah. yeah well, how do we make it more than uh, just a symbolic effort? Oh, got it. Yeah, I think it's just by doing things, honestly, right? Um, like, literally, just one by one. Uh, and uh, I think, yeah, just by actually taking action. Is that... Uh, what, what do the other panelists think about that? Anneli or Wonka? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I mean, you know, as I said before, like, it has to be meaningful, you know? We have to connect the dots. We can't just like, you know, go into like, I'm in Brazil right now. So uh, we've been in the favela and um, it's very important not to kind of, you know, just go in to like do a photo op and like give some money and like just leave, you know, we've been talking about making like long term relationships with projects here. Um, we've kind of like looked at a space. So we've already got space here um, and going to be building with the community here you know so it's very very important to work with people who are who who are on the ground who are in the local <coughs> communities like you can't just go in and say listen i can solve all your problems you know and and, and yeah you know, good that, point that and is that, not how yeah. it works yeah go, that's go. that's kind of that's kind of what i meant too is like just by taking action is like um for example i think um if you're not if you're if you're saying hey let's advance including for people with disabilities but um, like there's no people with disabilities in your community or there's not a lot, I th you, you really, you have to go one by one because there's, first of all, there's all types of disabilities. Um, and that was something that I was pretty ignorant to of like deaf and blind and coming into discord or like maybe what, what challenges would they have specifically? Um, so you, you really just have to, to, uh, like, like she's saying, like go into the weeds, go into the trenches and and uh actually take action on on you know you know reaching out your hand and saying hey what let me teach you first like this is kind of the what the, the lay of the land in this crazy web3 world um you know what what uh what would make it easier for you or better for you or how would you feel more included included in this space um so i, I think that's step one is just understanding the issue at, at hand yeah i also want to say oh, yeah. sorry that um tokenizing is uh, the use of technology and inclusion inclusion is a culture and those are very diff different things so we can tokenize everything without inclusion and uh to to actually foster inclusion in tokenized systems um it's not with the technology but with the culture and um, it's something that uh, I was uh, um, thinking of um, from yesterday's book club. And is, 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 the question is, are we the last of, uh, of um, something old? Or are we uh, uh, the new thing um, in, in, in that we are building? because we are building new things but we are we can also repeat old systems and old patterns and old practices of violence and a culture uh of non-inclusion so it's not uh it, the, the relationship is not um so much direct like tokenizing and inclusion is something that humans uh that are tokenizing should care for doing uh the inclusion 
And, and uh, at the beginning of the AMA, I, I passed it around and a couple of questions came up about time zone management, you know, being inclusive to uh, like, for instance, common stack, token engineering and giveth were all very US and Europe time zone focused, as well as uh, so people in Australia and Asia end up being excluded often. And then also language. Uh, Web3 is generally very English focused. Uh, how do we deal? How do we? How do we deal with this in a manageable way to include people from different time zones and that speak different languages? If I may for a minute. Yeah. Um, to the person who had talked right before you, when you were talking about, you know, where are we at? Are we the old or are we the new? Um, from somebody who's just recently discovered everything, it almost seems like you're becoming a bridge between the old and the new. At least that's my opinion. Thanks. And yeah, regarding what you were saying of time zones, Griff. Um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge because it's something that is factual and it's not something that we can build or change. But I think like um, having all these calls recorded and also allowing for, for asynchronous work, it's something really cool. And um, I also think that um, this thing of, of, of having more uh, communities uh, arising in the whole world, um, it would be something organic and something that uh, may take some time, but it's also something that is a strong point of this movement because we cannot be uh, targeted uh, like uh, one, one, one target, but it's uh, a, a, a very distributed network within the whole world. Anneli, Garrett, do you have anything on language or time zones? Well, yeah, t time zones are like the bane of my life. Like, I never know. But it's like, when, when you have to organize a meeting, like, and someone's giving you a time zone, and you, you've already traveled like three time zones in a week, and you're like, just tell me how far away this meeting is. You know, that's all I want to know. Um, so yeah, it can be it can be challenging, but it's, as someone said, asynchronous working is you know the kind of way to do it. Just to make sure you know you can record meetings, you can make working documents so people can like you know uh, update when when they can, and like that's kind of the predominant way that a lot of people work now because we're all remote, we're all you know digital nomads, we're all. Mm doing tons of stuff so like it's really really hard to synchronize everybody to get here at the same time you know uh so so you know if you can minimize those kind of meetings where everybody has to be there at the same time then that's definitely um the the best thing to do and also with languages like we're we're starting to expand a lot so i'm in latin america a lot now um and you know parts of the caribbean and like always speaking to you know speaking at least to someone who speaks spanish or portuguese um mm. and you know we're just about to uh really go into translating a lot of our stuff where we you know we want to have some some meetings in other languages um, because the predominant language is obviously English, but actually, you know, when we're working with the LATAM Herdau crew, uh, I want them to have meetings in Spanish or Portuguese, and like we're the ones who has to do have to do the catching up, you know, mm. uh, we're the ones who have to do the work to understand and like, um, and that's what I kind of want to promote a bit more, where it's not an English first kind of like culture. But also I want to say that it's um, something that it's kind of normal that um, and that's how we see it in Latin America, that uh, sometimes the changes that we see in the world uh, need some time to be applied here. So um, we, we think that by participating in these communities, even though that we're doing it in English, we are also um, accelerating um, the impact of all this into our communities. Mm. Yeah, good point. Um, also, I, I just 
yeah, go yeah we are Finish building it. communities also here in Latin America and like the things that that uh, we are uh, hearing in English then we are trying to tra translate them in Spanish and share them with our local communities mm. I like that the uh, uh, just spin off of the question as well um, you know off of time zone I think uh, we uh, from from the like in the from the disability standpoint, I'm, I've, I've been, uh, I've been so focused on like, uh, local, you know, that I, it hasn't really gone global yet. Um, you know, we've done some work with the UK, but I think web three is so global that, um, you know, uh, it's just, it's just fascinating how it, uh, <laughs> I mean, everybody on this call is like, uh, in a completely different time zone. So I think it's, it's inevitable that you do have to, to uh to figure out how to include like all the different time zones i i i lead puma's web3 if you guys are familiar with the brand puma um and and that's a very global company so we're always meeting like with germany and china and all that fun stuff so i think uh i'm kind of i'm used to it but i think from a from building an organization um <laughs> just it's a whole nother ball game when it comes to it. i think we're all we're all kind of in that boat of, uh, you know, trying to adapt to different time zones with Web3. Just because, uh, but I, from our perspective, I think just having, mod like, if, if specifically Discord, like, just having the moderate moderating team, each each in different time zones is another important one. Um, that way, if anybody pops up from while well, somebody's sleeping, there's always somebody that can handle it. But, uh, yeah, and then language is a whole other ballgame. I, I haven't even tackled that one either, but I think uh, someone mentioned that, that they're working on some some unique things, so I'll have to pick your guys' brain about that. But it's it's a huge huge barrier because Web three is so global that you you really have to touch on all those things. One thing I've noticed for sure is there are people that are like really ready to translate mm -hmm. content. You know, mm, um, really, so many teams, yeah, because it's it's um it's a win win for them. You know, like they mm -hmm. get to deep dive into into some interesting content and they get at the news to uh, and the good word to the their community that speaks their local language and and so there's like uh there's a, um, a terra swarm in one hive uh like right now in giveth we have two competing teams that want to translate everything you know and it's uh and, and there if you open up the space uh then it's it's there especially for like even when i was working on the dow in 2016 we yeah. had so many teams wanting to translate everything and we only survived three weeks you know mm. so uh, it, it's um it's pretty cool I, I think that there's there's a thirst for web3 in in different languages uh, but mm -hmm. um speaking of being inclusive you know i don't have to be the only one asking questions here so if you guys want <laughs> to if you have any questions uh, you, you can in, interrupt or you can also put it in the community hall and i can ask it for you there's a did community you, hall chat in rainbow did you just say dao in 2016 by chance yeah the the dao you know oh was it, what, what what do you mean the dao because that's 2016 i feel like that's super early for a dao that's yeah a, there was <laughs> there was the, the dao was this crazy dao that raised 14 percent of all ether in existence and then after three weeks got hacked uh, for $50 million. Oh, yeah, okay. The DAO is what you're saying. Yeah, okay. DAO, yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, that was, the, that was my fault. I'm sorry. That was a no, but actually, Riff, that is something that uh, inspired me to, to, to learn more and to practice more conflict management in this space. Because uh, that's what we call like a black swan event. Like no one was waiting for that to happen, but that uh, could have uh, been like a, a, a negative output or a positive output. And uh, the adaptation of the system um, is something that that um, is is showing that actually that event um, opened the space for so many new things um, into 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 this space and um, also opening the space um, to communities and um, um, noticing the technical deviation um, towards uh, developing that um, that these communities um, could have and uh, how working in a community is also something that can help uh, technology do um, and fulfill its 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 mission. Mm. 
Yeah, maybe, you know, yeah, go ahead, Garrett. No, no, you go for it. Go for it. Well, actually, yeah, I was going to ask you a question because you really piqued my interest on, like, blind people in Web3. That's going to yeah. be huge challenge do you actually know very many blind people that manage their own keys i mean is there even mm. key management solutions yeah there i mean no not that i know of um to to be honest i'm like uh i'm just scratching the surface of like um like what how how uh how the disability world even sees web3 so like diving into the rabbit hole of like how how blind people communicate in a discord or something like that is like a, that's even deeper down the rabbit hole that i um i'm just trying to like kind of broad strokes the whole the whole community for web3 or understand um because the, the thing about the disability world is they're pretty uh the the community in general is fairly behind when it comes to technology um uh, like development meaning like they're usually the last people to hop on the the technology train. I'm not. I'm not saying the whole community. I'm just saying as a whole, um, it's a little slower to adapt to like new technologies. Um, and this, as you guys know, with Web three, it, it's moved so fast, right? And things have changed so quick that that learning curve it only it only keeps going up. So, um, one of the artists we have on season one for Crypto Art is uh, he's blind, so he paints with his uh, by feeling the. Uh, um the the canvas and his colors right there's a ted talk on him his name's john bramble but uh the way that he feel he understands like colors is there's braille on the on the, on the red paint you know white paint but then he also makes white paint a little bit more thicker than red or black so he's able to feel like the textures of the paint as well while he's touching this um and i, I don't know can you link a, a photo in discord um but i just want to show you guys because it's pretty incredible what what, yeah, uh, you can put it you in. Can do. Uh, there's okay, a cool. chat channel. But yeah, to answer your question, I think we're still on the the, earning, the really early stages of like learning how, how and what what those challenges are. And I don't, um, I don't even think a lot of blind people. And I could be completely wrong here, but I, my guess is not not a ton, right? Are 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 diving into it yet? Yeah, probably not without some support from someone who can see. I mean, I just I can't even imagine how they could manage key software. But maybe uh, maybe I want to pass it to Annalie and see if you have any ideas on what is needed in the space for uh, fostering wider adoption. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. So for wider adoption, like, you know, this is what I was talking about in Mexico City. Like, people talk about like wider adoption or mass adoption and they've got absolutely no strategy, no programs. They don't even earmark any funding. Like, what are we talking about here, you know? So like, that's what I kind of like people to think about is this like, you know, put a plan in place, you know, how are you gonna reach people, you know? Um, I've, had, I've had people kind of like bring people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds into these like high high-end hotels and uh, you know it's like we we have to go to we have to go to where the people are right like um and a lot of people don't want to do that or they don't want to put their bodies on the line or they don't you know but we have to start going into these places and like uh you know not just i i'm in brazil right now so i can talk about that so not just the favelas we have to go out you know into the kind of like what what i would probably refer to as the the rural areas of brazil or like you know the suburbs of brazil like we just have to get out you know and then we have to kind of get out of the, like the major cities and stuff and just start connecting with people you know just start connecting with people and, and like uh connect with the projects who are working on the ground as i said already so like you know anybody who kind of wants to kind of do that wider work i mean come and talk to us at her dow i mean like our kind of mission is to you know connect with the people that you know are getting left behind connect with the people that you know usually aren't uh you know usually aren't on people's um you know tick list uh so we're really trying to get to the people who are definitely still marginalized and we all know that the that the gap between rich and poor is getting wider and wider and wider and wider so uh this is quite urgent work for us um 
so yeah that's that's it do you, I guess, you know, just for small organizations versus big organizations, you know, it's such a battle. Uh, like this, it seems like most small organizations are really stuck having in an attention uh, deficit game, right? So they have to play the attention game. How do we get the most attention that we can for our projects so people will be interested in it? And that usually means they have to point at the at the mass, right? At at the the normal people in crypto, the wider the 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 wider audience, and don't have a lot of resources to include certain groups. Uh, do you feel like there is more of an onus on larger projects than smaller projects, or is that onus still on onus still on the smaller projects to also be inclusive? I mean, I think I think the larger projects have a bigger responsibility to direct more of their treasury towards this problem um, with the smaller projects who would not have the resources in terms of you know finances and maybe capacity uh, you know I always find like a great thing is to just make yourself visible so people come to you right uh, so I've just found over the last few months whilst I've been on the road I've been speaking a lot and you know we haven't gotten a, a massive amount of capacity because we've just started and we're doing like loads of things at the same time but like that's really accelerated you know our our um our partnership working because people have seen me they've like, you know they've seen others and they come to us and say like how can we work together you know and that's probably what i would say to a smaller organization is make yourself visible so people know who you are what you're doing so they can come to you you won't have the resources to kind of like go everywhere and you know have these massive marketing budgets but that's kind of like a a kind of um low cost kind of way to 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 like accelerate your 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 reach i think you know and for the bigger projects just like you know, work with people like us, divert your treasuries, you know, like we, we kind of know what we're doing now. You know, we have those contacts, you know, we can make authentic connections and it's not just, you know, to fulfill your ESG requirement. Um, so there needs to be a lot more partnership working their understanding i think from people about what we're trying to do here we're not just trying to be you know do-gooders and just do nice things we're actually trying to just like change we're actually trying to change the culture we're actually trying to reflect kind of like value as well you know more more diverse teams bring like a greater competitive edge more diverse teams actually generate more revenue i mean there's so many there's so many cases there's there's there's, there's so many kind of like use cases and there's so much data to say that like this you know this kind of inclusion these inclusion efforts will benefit everybody yeah i also think that um the more structured DAOs and are, are being seen like uh, shelling points and uh, like smaller DAOs and re are repeating and uh, learning from from um, this structure that uh, some DAOs um, are building. And I think, uh, yeah, that's that's the importance of leading in the space. And like if 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 smaller DAOs um, understand why are we talking about um, inclusion culture and why are we doing so many um, efforts around community building? Um, yeah, they, they may also learn um, and, and try to reproduce. So uh, like good practices. So, so yeah, I think that um, the responsibility from, for, from uh, shelling points and more robust DAOs is also to, to, to help grow these smaller DAOs and to show some patterns um, that they are finding uh, useful for, for them. I, got I can. Yeah. In terms of the wider adoption, that's kind of what I was looking at, especially being new. I'm looking at it from a fresh perspective. Um, mm -hmm. I think part of it right now is there is a lot, and I mean a lot of different information, different organizations, even the bigger ones there's still a lot so the smaller ones have no chance for somebody new to it is there a unified place for people to go for resources you know think of it almost like if you're playing a video game i'm sure some of you have where's the tutorial app for getting into this you know if you can't explain it to your grandma 
And do you really understand it? Can you really explain it? Is kind of the way I look at it. Um, is there a place that people can go the most basic of knowledge to start learning about this and get included in it? And as far as the bigger companies and the bigger DAOs going and showing the smaller ones, we could, or sorry, we could kind of adapt how larger streamers will showcase a smaller streamer in order to get followers to go there to see where they're at. And also if there's a website or some sort of phone app or something along those lines that has a list, you know, so if I'm interested in getting renewable wood for woodworking, I can go to a list and search for those and find the one that I want to um, donate to or be a part of, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I know it's this is about having as many different options available, but sometimes to control all that chaos, you need one thing of order, one unified thing to bring everything together with the most basic setup where anybody can go on and look and search and have it be, you know, that's where you can also bring in the diversity for the disabled. So I know Blind probably use the... Um, the audio in order to navigate their phone, you know, so you have it so then it lists different options and they can use their voice or something like that to respond. I don't know much about that community. That would definitely have to be an idea from mm. somebody in the community, but that's my idea at least. Mm. As far as unifying one place to go, not going to happen in this space, unfortunately. <laughs> However, there are there are some really good spots like rabbit hole is a is probably the one that i've heard the most about lately for learning things because play to earn, play to learn or earn to learn uh, mm -hmm. they actually give you little rewards for uh getting up to speed maybe do you, does anyone else have any uh, good starter activities for people who are just getting in the space could i Ooh. yeah can i add something yeah yeah um, yeah, I recognize very much the need for like a map that would sort of guide me through all the projects. But at the same time, it feels a bit like building a manual for using the internet, which doesn't exist neither. Um, mm. There's so many different spaces around and the chaos is just part of it. You just have all these websites which would be DAOs, right? Um, but I know now that uh, for DAOs, a little bit related to the climate topic, so a little bit where I'm working in, um, there's going to be an initiative called Impact DAO uh, that is trying to go and make a list on all um, projects and DAOs that have that work on having a positive impact on the climate or social impact um, like that. But for the rest, I think um, for getting into the space and learning how to operate in DAOs, every DAO has its own way of working and it's really just about tiptoeing into it. And that's also the beauty of it. You visit them all. And to, to link a bit the inclusive aspect of it, um, I don't think it should be an aim, but it's a wordplay a bit, but I don't think it should be an aim for DAOs to be as inclusive as possible, but yet to be as accessible as possible, to make it super accessible for people to find their way around. And then the right people will stick to your projects and other will move on because it's, we really, really need a diversity in the space. People will come to you. When it's accessible, they will learn what they need to learn and they will start their own house answering to their own values. And that's what we want, because otherwise we will end up in a, in a closed system that will die. So the diversity is super important and empowering people to start their own initiatives with their own guidelines and their own ways of being accessible. Um, and what I also think is important is that we both have online communities and communities that are very much involved. And that's part of the of the diversity as well. We have to create communities underground in their very local reality with a physical space. Those have to operate as well with their mini economies and their DAOs, right? And then they all operate in a super diverse, in a uber uber chaotic system um, that we will have to navigate through. But I also have to make a shout um, to the Token Engineering Commons. I feel that's a really fertile soil for projects to grow, even for uh, projects related to inclusion, uh, like gravity and conflict management. And 
um, yeah, the framework that the DC um, used and the, the also that uh, is very related to the common stack framework is um, uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work. And yeah, that's that's also um, some some uh, guide that that um, we can continue iterating with uh, towards building sustainable digital commons. If you guys haven't seen, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm going to change the topic a little bit, but <clears throat> if you haven't seen the 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 com the community hall chat. Uh, Garrett posted an incredible painting uh, that was made by a blind a blind person. So definitely check that out. And um, I I guess and also NT added uh, alpha dot layer three dot x y z, which is another way that you can learn by doing. So thank you NT for jumping in. I I guess there's this dynamic that I think Lean really brought up. That's kind of difficult right having strong boundaries as a community is really important but then do, does that go against inclusive culture you know like if you have a a boundary saying like hey only people with this nft can go into this chat room or uh maybe even you have to be value aligned by this or oh this person is causing some chaos and we want to uh you know kick them out of the community uh, because it's more of a distraction or a problem are, are these challenges like how do you how do you dis, how do you keep an inclusive culture while still satisfying the needs of your community i think education i i think that uh the same way we learn to play the guitar or the same way to play we we learn how to engineering we can also learn uh, soft and human skills. Uh, so having a culture that is competent around communication is really important because that way you can uh, ensure that people can talk without taking things personally and without uh, and and having the, the ability to 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 be competent regarding complexity and not like start running away or turning uh, alarms. Uh, because they don't know what to do. So I think education is, is, is really key. And that's why um, it's so important to build a culture, a culture um, where, where people feel safe, where people feel that there are no privileges towards others. And um, that's something that, that, that I started saying and I uh, recall about conflict management and is uh, that you know that maybe there's someone who has like a long history in the space and maybe you're someone new in the space but if you have a conflict with them it would be really easy that um the the, the people who had a, like a long history um has like a bias um t towards them or maybe they can uh, enforce some power but um through having conflict management people can trust in the systems because they know that that um, there's someone, a third person, that would be able to place them both in the same in the same stage, and to yeah uh, think neutrally um, from from their needs of, of of one and another. And and yeah, like when people is not competent uh, handling conflict, um, yeah, it's really easy to to like take a decision, uh, a reactive decision. Uh, uh that that maybe it's not the best decision so it's also good to to foster all this of of like um um having like a cold mind to take decisions and also um uh, to 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 have uh, some processes where where like things cannot scale so quickly that they become like on unma on unman unmanageable Yeah, I guess I guess I, I want to bring it back to the common stacks uh, culture of inclusion around public goods and needs because I'll be honest, this is a little selfish, but we have we have this challenge, right? Public goods are supposed to be long to everybody, and so uh, an inclusion culture, you know, is is probably needed in public goods focused DAOs. Uh, I don't know how do we. And, and so I'm really curious, how do we foster a culture of inclusion, even in a small resourced environment? Does anybody have any ideas? I, 
I'm sorry to to talk again, but yeah, I think education, education, and and um, working not only in in the tools um, that we have on technology, but the tools that we have socially. Can you can you ask a question one more time? So, like, if you have restricted resources, like you're you're a, a nonprofit DAO, you're focused on you know helping the environment or or helping people with disabilities, for instance. Like, yeah. what are what are the the like biggest wins that you can make to be more inclusive? Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, um, you know, I think um, you know one thing that I'm I'm thinking about, like, kind of what moves kind of what moves the needle in Web3, and I think uh, for a lot of, pro like, because I think um, I talked with uh, Facebook and Meta the other day, and they said, like, one thing that they're focusing on is, is longevity in the space. Because um, I think you do have to take a step back and say, all right, well, what makes a successful project in Web3? Because I think a lot of projects kind of flutter. Um, and I think to really, truly make an impact, you have to, you have to stay stay alive and keep longevity. Um, so I think, you know, first and foremost, create longevity with your project. Like, what's going to make it kind of keep? Like you're saying, what are those some of those wins? Um, so the kind of the way that I think about it is, uh, you really have to make it make it a fun and cool community. But also, the, and what I, my kind of my goal, you know, if you guys look at that picture by John Brand, but um, it's really cool, right? And you don't know that he's blind when you first look at it, right? Um, it's just, it's just part of the, but it's a great conversation starter. And it's a great, it's a great, you want to learn more about who the artist is and then you find out, oh, wow, he's blind. Like, and maybe that sparks some interest, right? To learn more about the blind community. And then maybe that kind of leads you down the rabbit hole of like, oh, well, how does the blind community, you know, interact with Web3? Um, or how can we make the blind community feel more included? Um, so I think step one for, for me, um, and this could be wrong, but I, I think we want to we wanna make it really culturally cool, right? With, with, by art first. So, and I want it to be all disability artist led so that no matter what we create, the art, whoever looks at it is going to first, they're going to be like, wow, this is really cool first, right? Um, and I, that's what the artists with disabilities want. They don't want they don't want to lead with disability first. They just want to make something really cool and fun and culturally relevant first. And then it kind of is a a great conversation starter about you know being included too. But that's the cool thing about this space, right? I guess it's like the NFT is art first. You know, it's art first. It's tech first. So. People, people see that first, um, at least from my experience. So that, that's a really long answer, but we want to make it really cool. <laughs> that's a win. No, I, I think you just nailed it right there, man. I, I think that's the secret sauce. If, if you can make inclusion culture cool, if you can, mm -hmm. if you can like, it, inclusion culture means bringing, you know, a culture. And so mm. making cool is yeah. uh, making inclusive cool you know making inclusive and uh, incentivized in a way right is is uh it, whether it's financial or social or uh whatever dimension mm -hmm. you want to play i think that's yeah, the name I, of the game yeah i think and i, and I forgot the question. maybe you asked it first but i think you said something about um i actually maybe you didn't but it was like being not being i don't think it was the right term but being loud about it versus people just finding out about it or something like that but i think what I've noticed, because I've I've had a sales background my whole life, but it's usually if you if you lead with like, hey, come buy my thing, like people aren't going to buy it. You know, you kind of have to lead them into buying it. Um, and I think what 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 what's been cool about like kind of crypto hard so far is like um, we haven't led with like, hey, everybody like come come check out people with disabilities and like learn more about how we can include them in the space. It's been Yo, here's this dope art. Check it out. And then people that like it, they 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 want to learn more about it, right? And then they're like, "Oh my god, like <laughs> he's blind? Like there's no way, right?" Um, and it's just a great conversation starter um, versus you know going out and saying, "Hey, everybody, um, you know, blind people have this issue in the space." Like blah 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 blah. You know what I mean? Um, so that 
Like, and uh, so the the challenge next, the ch- next challenge I'm trying to figure out uh, is like, how do we how do we blend it with uh, with mainstream culture, right? So do we turn we, do we put the art on or not put the art, but do we do we combine artists with disabilities and designers, clothing designers with disabilities to um, a company like Puma, and do we create some sort of merchandise design that really really kind of infuses this uh, into the mainstream culture, or you know, do we design a coffee shop? that's completely led by people with disabilities. So when people are coming to get the coffee and they see this unique design, this out of the box design led by, you know, somebody that has autism, um, you know, they're first and foremost drawn to the design and then they come into the space and then they're like, Oh my God, who, who, who's behind this? And then they learn it's led by people with disabilities. I think it's a big, it's, it's, it's a really, really cool experience, but, just trying to figure out what the right way to blend in the culture is, you know? So right now it's NFTs and art, but what's next, next is the kind of the question. Yeah. Well, we only have a couple minutes left, so I just want to do one last round. Um, maybe like big success stories of inclusion. Uh, let's throw it to Wonka. What's, what's uh, a success story that you've seen uh, where inclusivity really won out? <laughs> Well, I am really surprised by the DC. Um, I am really surprised by, by that DAO. I, I think uh, it's like it, it has been my, my most engaging experience in a DAO and it has been a beautiful experience. And uh, the other thing that I want to say regarding one of the questions that wasn't asked is how can we measure inclusivity? And uh, there's something mm. that I like that inclusi- inclusion uh, is something that is a perception it's not something that we can objectively measure and it's a perception so i think um and this is something that i would like to work on uh, later is to have like uh, surveys of perception of uh, um regarding inclusion inclusion in daos and that way we can have like a baseline and then if we continue repeating the surveys we can uh, tackle and create strategies on the things that are that we find that are low and also see um, the improvement that we have done with the with the actions we promote um, in time if we repeat the survey. So I think that's good. And uh, yeah, that's what I want to say. Anneli, do you have any final thoughts on any of this? Uh, some of some of our biggest wins were um, uh, carrying. We we awarded 150 scholarships to uh, women to come to Eat Denver, and that was like one of the largest inclusion efforts like ever in Eat Denver, and we were super super proud and pleased about that. Um, you know, there was we attended a, a a Black History Month dinner whilst I was there, which was super cool, and attended by you know people like Eric Voorhees, and and got to talk to him, and he he like understood a bit more about why we're doing this stuff um and he kindly said that he would fund the next year's travel scholarships and so like that was a super big win and like yeah just 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 having so much success that we can expand into latin Latin america expand into the caribbean expand into southeast asia we're setting up a heard out in Nigeria so it's like you know all super great wins and it just means that you know more and more diverse people will be able to benefit from web3 so yes fantastic uh, thanks not only Garrett final thoughts yeah um, just kind of going back to that whole point of making it cool we um, in, a, in a month we sold about a hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, art for those five artists with disabilities um, and that was primarily to people that don't have disabilities, right? So I think we moved the needle a little bit in the Web3 space, but I think we, we have a lot of <laughs> a long way to go. But uh, that, was a, that was a cool win. Um, so hopefully we can keep, keep, keep building off that. And thanks to everybody on this call. I think you're all doing really cool stuff too. So Yeah, thank you all so much. We're a little bit over time, so I apologize for that. But uh, thank you all for coming and being part of Bring in inclusivity to Web3 and public goods. Thanks, Thank everybody. You, Thanks, Thanks all. Bye. Appreciate it. Bye. Everyone, see you later. Bye. Bye-bye.